Welcome to the Football Show on PLZ Soccer, sponsored by Arnold Clark. I'm Peter Martin. I'm delighted to see we've got three guests on the programme tonight. Alan Ruff is here with me as ever. Uh, and a couple of Mill United boys getting back together. It's not any great anniversary. We just decided Barry Ferguson and Paul Hartley. Sounds like a good midfield to me. Uh, so we've got lots to talk about. And uh, here's just a few things we'll be discussing. Yep, uh, great to see you, Paul. Um, we thought you disappeared off the radar for a pestered you long and weary to get you uh, into the studio. Um, how are you feeling about being out of the game now and maybe getting back in? I think disappointed in, in terms of losing my job, but um, I think it's just having a little break just now and see what it takes us and see if I really want to get back in the game in terms of the capacity of being a manager again. I think it's now becoming tougher and tougher to, to stay in the job and have longevity and, and financial security. So take a little bit of time out and, and see what my next step is. Yeah, I, I, I sense the word I'm probably looking for at the moment is disillusioned because I don't think Paul Hartley can become a, a, a good manager that everybody's talking about to suddenly being a bad manager. Yeah, but I think nowadays it's results-based and um, you know the results weren't great at the start of the season. We were only three games into it. We had to make a lot of changes. So look, I've came a little bit disillusioned with the game. Hopefully I can get that back in terms of, you know, <coughs> get the fire in the belly again. Um, I think just taking a little bit of time out just now and, and then see where I want to, want to go next. Yeah. Do you have to almost try and rekindle your enthusiasm? Reinvent yourself. Sometimes you had the disappointment at, uh, at Dundee uh, and then we go to Falkirk. And it was a tough 10 months for us, to be quite honest with you. There was a lot of changes we had to make behind the scenes. Try to change the environment. Um, but I think you've just got to try and... You know, take take a step away from the game and then see where it wants to where I want to go next. Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't lose heart if I was you because there are there are options. You could do the roughy option, which is basically you play tennis, golf, and then somebody offers you a directorship. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds a good job. To be quite honest with you. Uh, I mean, from Barry, you know better. I mean, you guys have played together when you were young. You've watched your careers uh, go hand in hand. Uh, you know international level as well and you've also sampled the management you know exactly what those mad pressures are yeah just what Paul said there I mean he, he made a, a lot of changes a, a lot of new signings in the summer and I, I forgot how many games it was but he just mentioned three games into the season I, I think it's far too early for me um, you need to give these new players time to settle in and as you, we know both ourselves so there's roughly new players coming in it does take time for them to settle in get into a, a new environment and a new formation um, but for me, I think managers are, are fired too early. Yeah, well, it's funny you say that. We were talking about it before we come on here. Roughly, the pressures now, you know, whether it's social media or whether it's chairman or board members listening mm -hmm. uh, to people who are on social media. Uh, I mean, as soon as I knew there was a new uh, board and ownership coming in at Aston Villa who wanted Thierry Henry, I thought it doesn't matter what Steve Bruce does, he's going to be out and he's been sacked today. Uh, I, I mean... No, a manager's job now, three, uh, four games and suddenly every, everybody's analysing you. Yeah, I, I think now in the modern day, if you if you look at the managers who do hang on to their jobs, they seem to have a good relationship with whoever is making the decisions. And if you can get that kind of partnership, you know, and a lot of the, the big clubs down in England, it's all foreign, foreign ownership, you know, so I don't know where the you know, how, how they get to know each other, but the ones who do stay in a job seem to have a good relationship and an understanding of what's happening behind the scenes. I've just noticed, obviously, being on the board at Perfect Thistle, there's a lot of decisions get made, but you have to be strong in these decisions. You know, the, the guys have touched on it there, you know, new players coming in, you know, and, and three games into a season is just a bit Yeah, ridiculous. and just on that point, um, before we move on to some of the other major news stories, um, from your own point of view, what do you think has been the fundamental change from Paul Hartley as a player uh, when you think about the you know, the, the constraints you had to work under there and how you had to be disciplined as a professional to management? For me, the, the pressure is much greater being a manager than as a player. I think you've got to put up with a lot of stuff that people 
that don't see it in terms of behind the scenes. But being a player, you just you trained and you played. Being a manager, you've got to, there's a lot of things you've got to work with in terms of the board. You've got players or players that are unhappy, and then we talk about the managers lost the dressing room. I, I've never really saw that. I think you're always going to have one or two players that are unhappy because <coughs> they're not playing, or you, you might not fancy them as a player. But I always, I always sense that when, when, when the papers or the media say that the managers lost the dressing room, I, I never ever got that one. Yeah, has the game changed though? That's the point I was trying to get. The from. game's changed. I think social media has changed the game terms of that and I think the game's more scrutinised now and um, I think uh, the board or directors um, put so much pressure on managers now and some of them probably want to interfere a little bit more than they did and instead of just sticking to what they know best and, and that's not football uh, in terms let the manager, let the head of recruitment, let the coaches, let the scouts deal with the football side and let them stay out. I mean I seen a thing with, with David Moyes a couple of weeks ago, I think he was talking his time at West Ham in terms of you know I think the owners there just let the manager manage or pick the players or the head of recruitment to do the football stuff. Yeah, uh, wise words indeed. Um, whether it uh, is something that anybody would pay any heed to, I have my doubts. Um, let's move on to some of the other stuff. If you think <coughs> management's farcical, <laughs> what about picking a semi final venue? Um, because we're now in a situation, Ruffy, where Celtic have written to the SPFL saying, OK, there might be a change of, uh, you know, when the games are going to be played, where the games are going to be played, but quite simply, we want a draw to determine who plays where. Yeah, and uh, I think if you cast your mind back to Stephen Gerrard, he was very adamant that uh, they're not going anywhere. You know, they're going to play at Hamden. So again, if that decision was to turn about, there's, there's going to be a massive fallout for that as well. You know, so we'll just have to wait and see. You know what's going to happen with that one, but I think the sensible thing would be to let Aberdeen go to Murrayfield. So it's not that far to travel for. Aberdeen to Edinburgh. Yeah. Uh, you're not used to this, but every now and then he'll throw a grenade and see who bites. Um, but uh, uh, another thing that uh, everybody's well aware of on the programme is the last thing you can do is actually show Ruffy the Stephen Gerrard interview because then he preempts it before you get a chance to see Stephen Gerrard saying that they're not for moving. We just leave it to the powers that be to, to, to make the decisions. Um... Uh, it shouldn't really affect us because we've been drawn out to play Aberdeen in the first game of hand and we don't expect anything to change but we'll wait to see you know, how it pans out and we, we look in with interest but um, we didn't have a complaint in the first place and we still haven't got a complaint um, and we wait to see how it pans out. Yeah, uh, wait to see how it pans out. Now, uh, here's you've got to be the most difficult pundit we've ever had or a former manager or player on here because you are the only one I can think of who's in a Darren Jackson situation. You've played for near enough every club <laughs> who's in the semi-final bar one. So uh, have you ever witnessed anything like it? Because Stuart Milne, the chairman of Aberdeen, has said it's embarrassing. Yeah, look, it's, it's never straightforward our game, is it? In terms of we've got two cracking semi-finals to look forward to. Because they'd not have made that decision before that. Play a game at Hamden, say, 2 o'clock, and a game at Murrayfield at, say, 4.30. Because both games are going to be screen live. But not for our, not for our game. They've, you know, they've, they've made a mess of it in, in, in my <coughs> eyes. I mean, you look at it, Barry, and I, I think embarrassing is the way to sum it up. If people are looking in at our game and see what's going on... I, I mean, I've heard some people today saying, you know, is... Uh, Neil Doncaster's position untenable now because of this whole debacle. But Neil Doncaster is merely, uh, uh, you know, the mouthpiece for the rest of the chairman who are, who run the SPFL. He is the figurehead who basically, you know, bows to their wishes. Yeah, it's it's farcical. Um, I, I don't know why this wasn't thought of before. Um, before we obviously they, they made the draw and you, you've seen the teams that were in the draw. But I, I'm with Paul. Listen. Two games, it's two cracking games, uh, two games of top quality teams. They're going to be shown live on TV. The easiest option at the start was to play one at Hamden and one through in Murrayfield. Why not do that at the start? And they're going to cause all this stuff where obviously Celtic come out and they're wanting a, re a, a redraw of the, where it's going to be played. It's, it, it's, it doesn't look good on, on Scottish football. Yeah, I, I just wonder now, Ruffy, if the SPFL will bow to that demand. I think they will. Uh, I think obviously there's been enough uh, talk about it in the media and, and obviously the clubs now are, are airing their views. We didn't know who was all in the meeting initially when they decided. The, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to think they'd have made the decision without the four teams being 
party of it. If that is the case, well, then well, it is ridiculous. Ruffy, if, Ruffy, it just, Ruffy, if, it just, if Aberdeen and Hearts say they weren't consulted on it, that tells you they weren't in I, the meeting. Yeah, I don't know about that. You know, I don't think Neil Doncaster and the police could make that decision without talking to somebody in, in the clubs. You know, I really don't. And if you cash your mind back, I mean, Rangers and Celtic didn't have a problem with it at all. They, they were just going to get on with it. It was, it was Hearts and Aberdeen for the right reasons uh, why they didn't want to do it. Is there no uh, something in place that Hamden Limited have got to have the two games? And yeah, they, which I think they, they were adamant they were wanting the two games, but uh, there's part to blame then. Yeah. They should obviously see that you're going to have 100,000 fans in the space of five, six hours. That's impossible. Well, the, the only one thing I would say that gets them off the hook in that is if you sign a contract with a company and say we're going to hold the semi-finals and the final there, then they're undoubtedly going to get the contract out from the table and say, well, you're yeah. going to have to pay us compensation but, but here. This is a deal. Yeah. You know, so, and to change it. But I always thought it was going to be a difficult situation playing two games in the one day in terms of four or five hours apart. Who knows what the weather's going to be like? But it's okay for maybe Aberdeen and Rangers. They're the first game on the pitch. It's going to be terrific. The pitch. It seems <coughs> like we've got bad weather that day. Yeah. Four or five hours. How are you going to get a pitch ready? Mm -hmm. I think it was always going to be difficult, but yeah. it's never straightforward for for Scottish football. That that's for sure. But my biggest problem over and above that, which I think is the, the most pertinent point, is the pitch. But my secondary point on this is how do you suddenly dispatch, you know, fifty thousand fans safely out of Glasgow? When some watch it in pubs, some who haven't got tickets for games suddenly run into Aberdeen fans, you know, uh, suddenly run into Rangers fans, Celtic fans, you know, it's just a we, recipe we know for what it's disaster. Like the, the Rangers game kicks off, I think it's half two, it's scheduled to kick off, uh, half twelve, sorry, um, the game. They're going to have Celtic fans in Glasgow out in the bars having a few drinks before they go into, into Hamden. They're going to meet each other, whether it be buses or, or underground or trains, it's... It's a horrible scenario. Yeah, uh, and, and if they do indeed get a draw, that's the next stage of this where everybody uh, looks at it and starts making other official complaints as well. This one will go on and on. Uh, we'll move on now to uh, two big games coming up tomorrow night. Celtic and Rangers involved in Europa League action, of course. Celtic already on their way to Austria against uh, RB Salzburg. Uh, and this one could be a tricky one as uh, Gabriel Antoniazzi looks ahead to the game. <laughs> Celtic's European adventure began with a rocky start after Champions League elimination, but thanks to a late Lee Griffiths header, the Europa League group stage started brightly with a 1-0 win against Rosenborg. Travelling to Salzburg presents a very different challenge though. Celtic will fear Red Bull Salzburg much more than Austrian rivals and Rangers opponents Rapid Vienna. After all, Salzburg did reach the semi-final of this competition last year. Salzburg, one of the most informed teams in the world at the moment, winning 20 of their last 22 matches and remaining undefeated since May. They sit top of the Austria Bundesliga, having won every match they have played. Salzburg beat their much-fancied sister team, Red Bull Leipzig, 3-2 in the first match to sit top of Group B. Ahead of the game, left-back Kieran Tierney knows that Celtic will be up against a top-class attacking side. Yeah, it's really tough, um, but it's, it's just not the defence as well. It's, it's all living on the pitch. You attack the team, you defend the team, um, and that's the way it is. So, yeah, it's, a, it's another test for us, a tough test away from home against a really good team who are on a good form, so I'm looking forward to the challenge. Celtic and Salzburg have met before in the 2014 Europa League group stage. Celtic were beaten 3-1 at Parkhead, but earned a commendable 2-2 draw at the Red Bull Arena with captain Scott Brown on the score sheet. Will the skipper lead by example again tomorrow night? Yeah, big question there. Uh, of course, when you think of European away matches, Celtic uh, used to have an abysmal record. And uh, with Paul Hartley on the show, Ruffy, there's no point in mentioning how many World Cups you've been to because every game we mention, he's got something to do with it. I think you scored a, in a Celtic game in Moscow yep. uh, on a very difficult surface to get. It was it was a draw, wasn't it? It was 1-1, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we took it back to Celtic Park and, and won in penalty kicks. But... I think tomorrow night's game is going to be a tough game. Salzburg is a good outfit. Celtic struggle on their travels usually, but I think the important one was the Rosenberg game. You know that Griffiths goal. I think that was a big three points for them. Yeah, and strangely enough, um, Barry, I look at Salzburg. You know, when you were looking at the groups, you thought, "Oh, Rangers have got a really <laughs> tough group here." But when you look at the two opponents that Celtic have, this is a side that made the semi-finals, and the yeah. general feeling is that they think they've got a better side now capable of going all the way to the <coughs> final. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult <coughs> task for Celtic. I mean, they've got, obviously, the, the backing of Red Bull. They've got a lot of money. They've got a lot of 
top players, I think. Um, so Celtic, I think, are going to find it difficult all over there. They just need to make sure they go there and and keep them quiet for the first 15, 20 minutes. Make sure they don't concede and then they've always got a chance at a set piece. Yeah, big bonus, Eduard declaring himself fit, Ruffy. Yeah, it is. Well, obviously, it remains to be seen whether away from home he plays with two strikers up front. I wouldn't think he would. I think his main problem would be trying to get out of the game without conceding uh, with the back four. Whatever back four it is, I need to prove to Brendan Rodgers that they are capable of going away from home to a quality side and try and see out the game. I mean, nothing each would be a fantastic result for them. If they nick a goal, fair enough. But I think we'll all be sitting watching it, you know, knowing as it was at the, the weekend there, Aberdeen got a few chances. Aberdeen cut through them quite a lot, and that seems to be the case this season. So they need to be pretty solid at the back of uh, this outfit who are on for them. Yeah, yeah better players can uh, can open you up with uh, consummate ease. <clears throat> Paul, give me the mindset from a manager and cast your mind back to when you were at Dundee. Did you look and think to yourself, OK, I know what I've got at my disposal. I think there's a weak part of that Celtic defence. I think when uh, before Rodgers came, I always felt that you could get at Celtic in terms of defensively. They've not always been strong defensively. And this season, you see the exact same again. They've not really that settled back four in terms of centre-halves. There's been one injured or suspended, whatever. So it's been, it's been difficult for them. I think tomorrow night, if they go there and be nice and solid and, and, and take a point, but they're not, they're not playing well just now, Celtic. They've not had top form yet. I think everybody can see that. I think Brendan said that, that their form's not been great. Yeah. Um, OK, uh, here's a situation where Celtic have got a tough one. Suddenly Rangers find themselves against a rapid Vienna team with a new manager. It hasn't been ideal for them. They're not in great form uh, in their Bundesliga. I think they're sitting eighth in the table at the moment. And uh, Stephen Gerrard reckons home advantage could play a huge part in this and he wants Rangers uh, to go all out right from the start. I'm not going to accept my team sitting back and... Um just waiting for the game uh, and waiting to waiting for a moment to join in the game. We have to be on it from the first whistle to the last. And you know, I've mentioned many a times how I wanted to look and what I expect of them. But the players have got to go and deliver that. And I'm sure the supporters are wanting that themselves. But the players know they, they've, we've spoke about it, and the players have given us feedback that they feel better when 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 we're on the front foot. OK, uh, give us your assessment. You've watched them uh, drop points against Livingston. Yep. Um, is that the ideal wake-up call for this game? Yeah, but as, listen, I, I've gave them plenty, plenty of praise this season. Um, certainly they've, they've improved under Stephen Gerrard, but Sunday was, was really disappointing. I thought, as I mentioned on Monday, he came out, he was open and honest. It wasn't good enough for, for Rangers. Um, I thought certainly in the final third, they lacked that bit of quality. And... Don't forget, I, I thought Livingston deserved the win, um, so he needs a reaction. He needs a, re a reaction for that team, um, and they need to be on the front foot for the for the first whistle. As yeah. simple as that, because the the Rangers fans will demand. It's a similar scenario to Celtic. If you have a defeat, you need to come back straight with a win. Um, that's what fans demand, and that's what the manager will demand. Yeah, Rangers legend Willie Johnson's <coughs> come out today, and he said, you know, you should unleash Glenn Middleton uh, on this Rapid Vienna team. I can understand where he's coming from because, you know, more often than not, we're looking at players that have something, a trick, mm -hmm. you know, a bit of speed, something that can cause European opponents problems. He is young, though. Yeah, no, I man. As Barry said, you've got to be on the front foot, and if you've got a player like that who's running at the opposition, it can get the fans excited as well if he goes by a couple of two or three and gets quality balls into the box, you know, they'll, they'll have a chance, you know. But I always feel when the Scottish clubs are playing at home, they've got a chance because I think the, the teams that come, you know, will sit in and try and nick something. And if they don't nick something and they're still level, they'll go, well, we'll just try and see the game out. And I think that's when you get a chance when you're at home to press the last 10, 15 minutes. And sometimes you get a wee break and you, you get the goal that you're needing. Yeah. OK, um, a couple of things uh, to finish. Uh, here's an interesting one. You two can uh, tell me if you've ever been uh, guilty of this. Um, Lee um, Miller has said that Alfredo Morelos was a disgrace not shaking hands at the end of the game. Do you buy into that? Have you ever been in a situation and you two, <laughs> you two characters <laughs> are perfect for this? I don't, Have I don't always think we, we, we shoot, shoot people's hands. I think you're disappointed after a game sometimes. If you've yep. not played well, either a poor performance, sometimes you're just, you just want to try and get into the dressing room. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, is it a prerequisite? You're asking listen, the wrong no, guy. I, can't, I would easily fight with somebody if I'd lost the game. If you, you get beat, as Paul says, you're disappointed, you're angry, you just want to get in that dressing room. But if a player <laughs> my opposition is beside me and he puts his hand out, 
I'll shake his hand, yeah. no problem. Yeah. But if I did get beat, I was wanting to go off the, the, the pitch as soon as I can. But I, I seen it. I seen it after the game. Um, a few of the players uh, rejecting the handshakes, and yeah. it's no nice to see. Ruffy, yeah. I mean, you're the nicest guy ever. Yeah. I, mean, you, <laughs> I just can't see you oh, doing it. Everybody else don't like getting beat, you know. Yeah. And then you've got to handle it. Uh, everybody handles it differently. I don't have a problem if. You know, but if, as, as Barry said, if somebody puts your hand out, you've got to shake it, but you don't necessarily. Yeah. But if you get a chance to go on YouTube and see Barry trying to shake Arthur Boric's hand Just after a game. <laughs> 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 you see, the look at his, the look at his face is priceless. Yeah. yeah, yeah, what happened that day? What happened that day? I don't want to say what I said after that. <laughs> Br brilliantly remembered, Ruffy. That, well that's the only Celtic player that's ever rejected. The handshake is that right? Aye, but I, I listen. I know how we feel because we won that day. Similar when I get beat off Celtic at, at Celtic Park, it's hard. But again, if they put your hand yeah. out, you've got to be a man you're, and think you've got to shake it. You know, you're, you're disappointed, but you've got to say, Well done to the opposition. Yeah, uh, funnily yeah. enough, you know, when you see you, you guys playing for the, 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 the youth teams, and then you go up through the ranks and you, you're playing against each other regularly, and then you're playing at international level, what was it like in the middle of the park against each other? I think we all did. It was always good battles Aye, between myself not. and Barry. We, we, we grew up in terms of playing at, at Mill United. I think it was under eights. Um, and then obviously played against each other at Hearts and, and Celtic. But once we became international mm -hmm. teammates, it, it was totally different. Yeah. We always had the respect for, for, for right. each other. That, that was a key thing. Yeah, but it's, listen, you've got the respect up to the whistle goes yeah. and then that goes out the window for 90 minutes or 92 or 93 minutes. But again, after it, win, lose or draw, you would always shake because oh, he's somebody who I grew up beside and somebody you always looked at their career and I guess Paul would um, say the same. Yeah. You always yeah, look yeah, out definitely. for one another. But um, no, we had a lot of good battles. Yeah, there's a glint in your eye there when you said that. And wait till you see Ruffy, <laughs> there's no glint in his eye when I deliver to him the last little bit of information that's come in, Ruffy, that I want to get your thoughts on. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott McKenna's been handed a two-match ban for his challenge <laughs> on odds and Edouard. Yes. Aberdeen have rejected it. What's your, what's well, your take on that? Up, that <laughs> sums up every appeal that's happened this year. Then nobody, there's no consistency whatsoever. And it started with, obviously, Morales up at Pitodri with a kick. And, uh, and, and now everybody appeals. They just yeah. appeal, and I was listening funny, quickly. I was listening to Willie Collum, who was saying the, the referees have no chance whatsoever because the clubs are coming into that meeting with a lawyer, and they cannot beat a lawyer. Yeah, uh, it's gone crazy now. Uh, just before we finish, uh, Paul, last word uh, for yourself because you've uh, played for so many of the teams. But this is a good this is a good uh, start to the season, I think, at the top end of it. How do you rate? the likes of the Hearts, the Hibs, the Aberdeen, their clubs that you've played for, they seem to be making a good go of it, especially Hearts. Yeah, I think everybody's been looking for a challenge over the last couple of years to Celtic. Now, now we've got, I think we've got a challenge now. Hearts are very strong, their, their, their recruitment's been good. I think Rangers will be strong, Aberdeen will get stronger, and Hibs will get stronger, and Kilmarnock. I think Kilmarnock are a right good outfit. Mm. I really enjoy watching them play. Um, so I think we've, we've got a good league in uh, this season. I think it'll be very, very tight. Yeah, OK. Um, if you could give me a one, two, three, what would you go? It's a bit obvious, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, th I think it'll be tight. I think it'll be... I think Celtic will win the league. I think you've got to look at Celtic, possibly Hearts, Rangers. I, I think it's I think it's going to be difficult this year. Yeah. I, don't, I think it's a, a tough one to call. Yeah, um, OK, an interesting one. We've got the three out of them. We'll bring them back on at the end of the season and absolutely leather them if he gets it wrong. Um, but nevertheless, we hope you do get back into football uh, very, very soon indeed. Thanks to Paul Hartley. Thanks to Ruffy and to Barry Ferguson. Uh, don't forget, you can subscribe on our YouTube channel to see more of us Monday to Friday. Thanks for watching. I think be open about your experiences. I think it's okay to talk about your experiences. Um, it's it, you're not any less of a citizen if you if you talk about your experiences. I, I think about m myself. I, I I hated talking about race. I hated talking about my faith, uh, partly because I'm just a Glasgow boy like anybody else. Um, I don't see myself as that identical Muslim or an identical Asian background. I see myself as a West of Scotland boy. So I don't like I didn't like talking about race or religion because it was in some ways highlighting my own difference. 
but you get to a certain point where you have to you find the confidence to speak about these things. I've now got the confidence to speak about these things because I think I'm in, I'm in mainstream politics now. I don't, I don't need to worry about being pigeonholed or, or labelled as something that I don't want to be labelled as. So I was, my advice to young people would be is be confident in yourself, be confident in your identity, be proud of your identity. If you experience something, talk about it. If something goes too far, report it and share your experience with others. Because only if you share your experience with others, you'll learn from other people's experiences um, and hopefully help make a change in our communities.